today on Dr. Phil. She kept saying, Mikey's not breathing, Mikey's not breathing. They lost their son. I just picked him up and he was gone. Then they discovered abuse. You find out that your own father has violated your daughter. With so much tragedy. You have screamed at him that he is not grieving right. There's no right or wrong way to grieve. Can their marriage be saved? I don't want my marriage to fall apart. I already lost enough. Let's do it. Why don't we stop all the drama, stop all the fighting, and let's go get you better. Here we go. Have a good show, everybody. If I can help get this family back on track, are you willing to do that? Ready, free. Take. This is going to be a changing day in your life. You know, it seems like marriage in Hollywood is kind of a seasonal sport. Easy come, easy go. But the truth is, marriage is intended to be a very serious, lifelong partnership. You enter into it hoping it will be a union marked by joy and shared experience. But you just know there will be times that you will be called to stand shoulder to shoulder, to face the tough challenges, ones you would never want to endure alone. To me, that is what marriage is really all about. Clearly, marriage isn't always easy, and today's guests couldn't agree more. They are a prime example of the question, why do such bad things seem to happen to such good people? Now, Tiffany and Richie are a fresh and bright young couple that have already lived through more than any two should be expected to endure in terms of tragedy and loss. And now they say, but as a result, their marriage just seems to be hanging by a thread. We've had a lot of traumatic things happen in such a short period of time. We got married in 2004. We pushed the wedding up six months because we found out we were expecting. A week or so before the wedding, I miscarried. I was very upset, obviously, losing a child. We found out shortly after we got married that she was pregnant again. At around 23 weeks, we found out our son, Richie Jr., had a chromosome abnormality. They said if the baby did survive the pregnancy, his life expectancy would have been maybe a year, and that was pushing it. And we chose to induce. He came out stillborn. It was probably the worst day of my life. After losing Richie Jr., I was blaming my husband. I was blaming doctors because I wanted an answer why. Tiffany was in a very, very deep depression. I really didn't understand what she was going through. And it put a big strain on our marriage. Tiffany thinks that I should deal with grief the way that she does and relive things and show a little more emotion. I bury a lot of stuff inside of me, try to deal with it in a different way. I get very, very mad at my husband. I find myself yelling at him a lot because he's not grieving the same way I am. Okay, now, first, uh, let me say to the two of you, um, I I'm glad you're here. Thank you. And uh, all humility aside, you're in the right place. Because I'm going to tell you, I take your marriage very seriously. I take your family very seriously. I take your pain very seriously. You heard me say at the top of the show, you, you two have been through a lot, true? Yes. This has been tough for you. She says you deal with this differently. I don't think you've skated through this one bit. I think, just father to father, I admire your strength and I admire your courage. What has this done to you? It just, it tore me apart. Trying to be strong for my wife and for my kids I do have. While you've tried to be strong, it's hurt inside. Yes. And what have you said to yourself? Do you beat yourself up about it? Do you think you failed her? Do you think you failed these babies? To a point, yes. We've talked a little bit about what's happened, but there's more to this story that, that people don't know. Uh, Tiffany and Richie went on to have two healthy children. Then in February of 2012, Tiffany gave birth to their third child, 
they were just overjoyed. <laughs> but then the unthinkable happened again. And it nearly destroyed both of them and their marriage. Take a look. About a year ago, my husband and I had another child. When Mikey was born, he did have a very serious heart condition. The doctors weren't sure he was going to make it. He spent about eight weeks in the NICU. It was very, very difficult. It was about a few weeks after him coming home, I would start to notice he started aspirating on his formula. He would stop breathing for a couple seconds, but I was able to pick him up and then he would start breathing again. Mikey had a monitor that would check his heart rhythm and his breathing. On the early morning of May 17th, I fed Mikey his 4.30 feeding. I always watched him to see if he was going to start aspirating. I never thought in a million years I would close my eyes and I fell asleep. I woke up two hours later and I picked him up and he was gone. And I immediately started giving him the CPR and I couldn't bring him back. I, I tried and I ran him to my husband and I told him to keep giving him the CPR while I called the paramedics. She kept saying, Mikey's not breathing. Mikey's not breathing. After numerous CAT scans, my son had no brain activity. He was brain dead. This was torture for me, seeing my child on life support. We chose to take him off of life support because I couldn't stand just to see my baby lay there. No, there was nothing that I could do, and I, I blame myself so bad. As he was placed in my arms, he took four breaths and he was, he was gone. I hate my soul. I couldn't save him. I blame myself. Why didn't I have his monitor on him? Why did his CPR not work? Mikey's death took a toll on both of us. My husband doesn't talk about it. That's his way of dealing with it. And I didn't want to talk about it because I want people to remember him. It almost makes me feel like he's not in as much pain as I am. I don't think Richie realizes how much I need him emotionally not to shut down on me right now. As tough as it is for him to talk about it, I need him to talk about things with me and our son and what has happened so we can get through it. So you're just overwhelmed at Very this much. point. So after everything, what did you say to yourself when you lost when you lost Mikey? It was the hardest thing. I just don't think that I should be ever happy again. Because I couldn't save him. He stopped breathing on your chest at 4.30 in the morning. After he was feeding at 4.30, somewhere between 4.30 and um, 10 till 7 when I woke up. I just knew something was wrong and I just picked him up and he was gone. And usually I would think that I would panic, but I just, he just kicked in, you know, CPR. And I started giving him CPR and I couldn't bring him back and I kept trying. And everything's just going through my brain. Like, why did, why was this monitor not on? Like, I don't remember falling asleep. It was awful. And part of me just died that day with him. I just. And so your belief is that he has shut down yes. about this. But you do hurt inside. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be strong in this moment. Tell her what you feel. I miss him. <laughs> He's my baby. Hurt. I love you. I want to make this work. I want our family to stay together forever. That's what I feel. I want to. I don't want my marriage to fall apart. I already lost enough. It, it, it takes a toll. It does, and and nobody teaches us how to navigate that, right? And so you, you don't know what to do with these feelings. And, and you look at him, and, and he's different. And you don't know what to do with those feelings. 
And I, I want to start unraveling that ball of yarn for y'all. Thank you. And we're going to take a break. And, you know, everybody that's watching this right now is thinking, my God, the, you know, that's unbelievable. And Richie and Tiffany thought they had been through the worst. You're all thinking, yeah, that's enough. But sadly, that's not the bottom. Because another inconceivable event sent them reeling. We'll tell you about that when we come back. My father-in-law kept saying, I'm so sorry I did this. I kept thinking, this is a nightmare and I'm going to wake up. I literally wanted to kill my father-in-law. Well, Tiffany and Richie are here. They are struggling to keep their marriage together against incredible stress. They have suffered through a miscarriage, a stillborn, and the death of yet a third child. But then their world just stopped one more time when their two and a half year old daughter came home saying four horrible words. On Memorial Day weekend of 2010, my daughter was two and a half years old. As I was putting her pull-up on her, she stated to me, that my father-in-law had licked her butt. I kind of hesitated.
for a second and okay maybe she said he kicked my butt you know like in a joking way so i asked my child again what did he do and she said paw paw licked my butt i literally wanted to kill my father-in-law it hurts because it's my my baby and was also somebody else that was a big role in my life I called my mom and had my daughter tell her what she told me. Then my dad called me. I asked him what had happened. He said, I'm sorry, I don't know what's wrong with me, and started crying. And I just hung up the phone. I have not talked to him since. My husband, I'm sure he was distraught, sickened, angry. However, he was not saying much. Kind of just withdrew himself from the situation and almost like if we don't talk about it it never happened tiffany wanted me to go over and confront him and i just i didn't want to do that i wanted the courts to handle it i took her to our nearby hospital the police came to the hospital to get my husband's written statement regarding the conversation he had with his father my husband never made a statement i told him that he had an appointment at two o'clock with the detective, and if he did not keep that appointment, I had a three o'clock appointment with my attorney to file for divorce. I, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't know what to do. I was confused. Tiffany felt like I was taking my dad's side, and I wasn't. Me and my wife handle things differently. I want to talk to her, but I don't want to keep reliving everything. I want to try to put stuff behind us and move on. I want to be a happy family again. This had to be incredibly shocking on top of everything else. And do, do you get here for Richie, this was a double loss? Yeah. I mean, someone has victimized his daughter. Mm -hmm. And he also lost his father. You find out that your own father has violated your own daughter, which is... Uh, uh, the ultimate betrayal. I tried to put myself in his shoes, um, but my ultimate thing was that I was just making sure my daughter was protected. I never looked at it. I tried to, to put myself in his shoes, I, but I couldn't. I just was focusing on her. Now, I'm going to ask you a straight-up question. We've got to be real honest mm -hmm. here. Do you have any concerns about your husband, like father, like son, mm -hmm. that there's a genetic predisposition here? Do you have any suspicions, any concerns about your husband at all? Absolutely not. So you have no concerns about that at all, nor should you. I'm not saying you mm -hmm. should, because that's not how that works. Right. Absolutely okay? not. So th that's not on the table. <clears throat> no. But have you ever said to him, I I'm, I'm sorry that you've had to endure this, the loss of your father? the betrayal of your own father hurting your own daughter? Have you ever shown him any compassion? Have you ever shown him any, any, any type of, of, of comfort or, or, or solace for, for what he's gone through in this regard? I think that I've tried sometimes. Maybe I haven't tried hard enough, but I can tell, I guess just being around him, I can tell if he's hurting and I'm, and I'll try to talk to him like, is it, you know, is this bothering you? Is, you know, because of what your dad done, or things like that. And I try to show him sympathy, and but he, he don't want to talk to me <clears> about <throat> anything. Well, you just said something that I'm not sure is true. You said, I can tell if he's hurting. I'm not sure that's true, Maybe because not. you have yelled at him and screamed at him that he is not grieving right, because he's grieving differently from you, that he's shut down, that he's not caring, that because he is not emoting in the way that you are, that that is somehow deficient, mm -hmm. that he is somehow not there for you, that he somehow doesn't care as deeply. And you say, I, I can tell if he's hurting, and I don't think that's true. Maybe I can't. There's no right or wrong way to grieve, but it's there. And I'm not saying this to make you feel bad. No, I'm I know. I'm saying this to try to know. open a new perspective, a new vista in what you're thinking, because this is a family that has to heal. All right. So, look, there are so many questions here. Uh, you know, can, can Richie stop blaming himself for his son's death? Can Tiffany stop blaming herself? 
Uh, all of these recriminations come. It's, the, it, it, it's a very predictable thing. That doesn't make it any easier. We're going to talk about all of that when we come back. I'm still so distraught over losing my son that my patience with my other children is not like it used to be. I find myself yelling at them because I'm just so stressed out and distraught with what, going through this. And, you know, they're just being kids. They feel awful. You have three children at home, right? Yes. yes. And they need their mother. They need their father. Mm -hmm. And listen, they don't understand. They don't get why joy isn't permitted. They don't understand why there's a tension between mom and dad. They don't understand why you catch yourself laughing and feel guilty. And you do, don't you? Yes. Why am I laughing? Like, I don't deserve to be happy. I don't deserve to be happy. Because my baby's not here, and I couldn't save him. I feel so guilty. <laughs> you, you have children that you have lost, and the ones that survived you're punishing by being lousy company. Does that make sense? Yes. It, it, it's so clear when you step back and look at it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I lost these children, so I think I'll make these that survive miserable. That's not what you want, is it? So what that means is you, you have to forgive yourself here. You did the best you could with what you had. You've got to give yourself permission to celebrate the lives of those children that are lost. Look. It's okay. Mommy is going to give mommy permission to have joy in this family, in this home. And, and it's not a matter of feeling guilty about it. You deserve that. Aren't you a good mother? I think so. Aside from being lousy company, aren't you a good mother? I mean, don't you take care of these children? Don't you love these children? I do. Is she a good mother? Wonderful. Yeah. Is she a good dad? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, don't let the legacy of Mikey be to look down and see his mother cry every day of her life. I mean, come on. Do you think that's what he wants? No. Oh, I, I was born and spent five months in this life, and my legacy is I left a mother and father in pain forevermore. What a crummy assignment. Don't do that to him. Don't, don't do that to him. Come on, he deserves better than that. Are you upset with her at all for anything she has done with any of these children lost? No. Do you feel that she failed the standard in taking care of Mikey? No. I mean, she's up at 430 feeding this little guy. Do, do, do you feel like she failed the standard, that she was negligent in any way, that she didn't pay attention, that she, that she failed to do something she should have done? No. Look at her. Look her in the eye. Don't look away. I'm talking to you, but you look at her and you look at him. Why did you marry her? Because I love her. Tell her, why did you marry her? Because I love you. Why? Why did you love her? I just fell in love with her. Tell her. I just fell in love with you. Why? What about her? I think you're beautiful. Thank you. Tell her what you want. I want to do whatever we have to do to make our marriage work. I want to be a happy family. Me too. I want to be able to celebrate Mikey's life and not be sad all the time. I want, I want you to understand that I can't be as strong as you. I just, I want normal back. It's going to take a long time to get there. But I want to be back to being the mom that I was. Making my kids laugh, making my husband laugh. 
because I'm not that person right now. But I want my marriage to work. I don't want to split apart. Now look him in the eye and tell him we are not going to quit on each other or our family. We're not going to quit on each other or our family. No way. No way. I agree. Give your wife a hug. <clears throat> All right, next, their relationship started with the loss of a child as well. But their way of dealing with it was completely different. We'll meet this young couple when we come back. I told him that he was being jealous, he was being paranoid. I kept the affair going. He says that he just can't let go of what I did. At this point, the trust is so far gone, it, it's hard to even look at her anymore. The loss of a child can knock a couple's compass it was way off course, and it can be way underestimated how much this affects people. And everyone grieves differently, but some people fill the void in all the wrong ways. Now, that's exactly what I think my next guests have done. Take a look. Right after our first son was born, I went through his cell phone. I saw messages that were pretty sexual in nature. I miss you. I can't stop thinking about the time that we were together. He was trying to cheat on me. He was very apologetic, begging me to forgive him. A few months after the first affair, I found out Aaron was having another affair. I started texting half a dozen women inappropriate things. I'd never had sex with any of the women. I found out Aaron saw a neighbor that he was interested in and left a note on her car asking her to contact him. I told him that I was done and I wanted to get a divorce. So, did they get divorced? Well, no, they went to a counselor and they say as a product of this counseling, they decided to what they call open up the marriage. What could go wrong here? She and I decided through counseling that we would open our relationship. He was emotionally connected to me, but he had physical needs I couldn't always take care of. There were some rules put in place. There were to be no emotional connections. It was supposed to be purely physical. If we were gonna use the house to have sex with somebody else, they weren't to stay and hang out. It was strictly for the open marriage. It sounded like a great idea on paper, and when push came to shove, it didn't really get that need met. Well, at least they had rules. Um... But that didn't last long because Aaron decided it wasn't working for him, and so he wanted to close the marriage back up. Now, unfortunately for Aaron, it was working for Ashley, and she continued her affair for another two months. You know, I said earlier, what could go wrong here? Well, put that on your short list. During the open marriage, I did find a person and we really hit it off and we're having a good time. She told me that it was just a friend. I told him that he was being jealous, he was being paranoid. I kept the affair going after we had agreed to break things off with all other people. Aaron found my journal and he found out that I had lied. He was very distraught, heartbroken. I feel like he felt all the feelings that I felt way back when. Well. Now, this was Aaron's idea to begin with, to open this marriage up. But he was so upset that a Ashley had the audacity to continue her relationship after they agreed to close their marriage that he spent a year in deep depression. Then they found out that she was pregnant with their second child. Well, Aaron said, well, okay, we'll work this out. But then he decided that he wanted a divorce. So he moved two doors down into his mother's house. The past six months have been an emotional roller coaster. Every few weeks or so, I'll try to move back in, see what we can do to work on it. We'll have sex, and basically, it dies from there. He says that he just can't let go of what I did. 
he just can't let go of my affair. And he believes that I damaged him so deeply that he's incapable of being the husband that I need him to be. I would like to see her change, but at this point, the trust is so far gone, it, it's hard to even look at her anymore. OK, um, can we all agree that this open marriage idea didn't work? Absolutely. Obviously. You know, we, we don't need boundaries. We, we trust each other. We love each other. We're committed to each other emotionally, but we can go do this. And that was your idea, right? Uh, it wasn't really, per se, my idea. It basically came from her in our counseling session to where she was basically drained by my sex drive and getting my needs met as, long, as well as going to school and work. So it this was, was your idea? You wanted to open marriage? I don't think it was my idea. He's right about the fact that he does have a high sex drive and a lot of sexual needs, and he felt that I was being burdened by having to meet, meet those needs, needs sexually. sexually. So this was your gift to her? <laughs> no, come on. I mean, I, listen. <laughs> Let's just be honest. I'm, I'm trying to get us back on track here. Here's what it sounds like to me. You say that you had six emotional affairs. It wasn't on an emotional connection with these people. It was... Well, you had six inappropriate assignations with non-wife female units. What do you want to call it? Inf I... Infidelity. It, it, it's okay. clearly, it's not right. I think the reason we say it's an emotional affair is because it was an affair, but it wasn't sexual in nature. It was just... Well, I'm not sure I believe that, but... You say he has a high sex drive, but you believe that he didn't have sex with these women he was corresponding with on text and emails and phone. I and... think that I found out before it got to that point. I've yeah. always found out very quickly. Yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> but neither here nor there. So you have six of these, and she catches you at it, OK? And so then you say, however it comes out, you said in your tape, you said through counseling, we come up with this open marriage concept. And so you do it because you say this will lighten your load. Pretty much. This is for you. <laughs> but then you, f you find someone to connect with. I did. And so you stayed involved after it was called we off. We agreed to call it off, and I okay. did stay involved with the person I was seeing. For two months. Right. And you hid that from him, I and did. you felt betrayed. Absolutely. Okay. Very. All right. All right, we got to take a break, and then I, I, I want to. I got a pivotal question, and I, I think a salient piece of advice, if I do say so myself. Uh, we'll be right back. Aaron sought out the attention of other women, was told he had a sex and attention addiction from other women. And then they kind of decided to try an open marriage. Now, they were, they've been together since high school, right? You, you just got, after. Just after. You, you got pregnant early on, lost the baby. Sorry for y'all's loss in that regard. In this open marriage, you made a connection. Aaron got depressed over this affair because you continued it after y'all agreed not to. And then you moved out when she was four months pregnant with this child, this correct? Our second son. Right, the, the mm -hmm. second child. So you have a six-year-old and a six-week-old now, correct? Correct. Aaron says he wants a divorce, and Ashley says she wants to save their marriage. So you're done. You, you want out. At, she, at, ca she catches you six times cheating on her. You catch her once cheating on you, and you say, I, I, I'm out. When we got pregnant with our most recent son, we had to have a paternity test. It was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. It, it's just so much harder to, for me to get over, I guess. It hurt your feelings. Very much. Now, I need, a, I need a clear answer here. Was this open marriage your idea and something you wanted to try or not? No. When it, it was, was suggested through counseling, I, I remember that it was basically suggested by her. 
it was something that we had heard through our counselor, but nothing that I have ever really, I didn't bring it up. I remember her being tired from school and work, and when it came to sex, it was like, I'm just exhausted, so here's Listen, a suggestion. I'll let, I'll let her weigh in, but here's all the information I have, that this was your idea, that you wanted to do this open marriage, and that you sold this to her as, look, this is a good deal for you. We were both young. We don't know what all is out there. This will get this out of our system. This will take the burden off of you, because I'm wearing you to a frazzle here. And you're, you're, you have all this going on, and you're trying to take care of my needs. I, I won't get involved with these people, and that you were behind this, you wanted this, you pushed this, you got it, and then she got connected up, and you didn't. And so you said, eh, don't want this anymore. Now, where, do I, where am I getting all this if that's not true? Am I, am I reading this right or wrong? Yes, I think so, yeah. I mean, I agreed to it, but... I think the idea did come from you. After, after everything that you have done in the past with all these girls, why would I, why would I just say that I want you to go be with other people? This wasn't pushed by me. This was nothing that I was like, light bulb, let's try this. At a minimum, you agreed to it. Absolutely. Listen. I you guys are, are really young, which means you're really new at this. And you've been married how long? Um, since Seven 2006. Years in August. Seven years in August. Okay. So this is like a car that isn't even really broken in yet. You're, you're new at this, seriously. Sure. And it's really hard to take back stupid. And when you go make a decision to go out and get in an open marriage, that's just stupid. It's just stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Right. And so when you guys get together and make a stupid decision and then get mad at each other for what happens within that stupid decision, that just seems unfair. It really, it seems unfair. All right, we have to take a break. Next, Aaron and Ashley living situation is confusing to their six-year-old. What do you do for them? I'm going to tell them what I think when we come back. We just had a baby six weeks ago, and I don't want to put my kids through this. Our six-year-old doesn't know what a normal family is anymore. Sometimes dad's home, sometimes he lives with grandma. Sometimes mom and dad really love each other, and sometimes they are fighting with each other. I think we're going to do a lot of damage to our children. Well, Aaron says he can no longer trust his wife and wants a divorce. Ashley says she wants to save their marriage for the sake of the two kids. The question is, can this marriage be saved? Should this marriage be saved? And if so, what needs to happen for that to occur? Now, you, you do agree that for you to be judging her harshly is a little hypocritical because you've been guilty of infidelity as well. Sure. Okay, and you understand that he has very legitimate reason to say you did some things that you hid from him. Absolutely. And so, which means you, you did constructive lies. He read some things that you had written mm -hmm. that weren't intended for his eyes. Right. Mm -hmm. And so to say, well, why don't we just hit the reset button and start over? It's a little harder than that for him. Right? Sure, yeah. But um, listen, you do have children involved here. Yeah. That you two made the conscious choice to have. You lost a child, as we said. Mm -hmm. But you've, you've gone on, I hope, thankfully, and had two children here. Yes. And I'm their voice here. I don't believe the two of you have given this situation a legitimate effort to try to resolve what's gone on here. You owe it to yourselves, you owe it to these children to make a legitimate, concentrated effort to resolve this relationship. So, when those children come to you in five years or ten years and say, Daddy, how come I didn't get to grow up with you and Mommy in the same house? You have an answer better than, well, 
I just had a big sex drive, so we decided to have an open marriage, and it blew up in our face. You want to have a better answer than that. You want to be able to say, you know what? We did everything in the world we could to keep this family intact. We turned over every stone. We investigated every avenue of rehabilitation. We went to serious counseling, and at the end of that, we decided the best answer for all of us was to live in different homes but love and respect each other and co-parent y'all in a right and, and proper way, and that's what we did. You want to be able to say that, and right now you can't say that. So what I want you two to do, look, you can get a divorce for the rest of your life. What I want you to do is allow me to handpick you a serious, serious marriage counselor that will sit down and unravel this, and I ask you to give me just 90 days, give me 90 days to have this person sit down and try to build a love-based, trust-based foundation for this relationship where you come up with a plan that you can both be excited about, where you feel at peace, you feel at peace. <laughs> and if at the end of that time you can't, then okay, you shift gears and say, how can we co-parent these children out of love where there's no conflict between in-laws or us or whatever? We'll, we'll shift to co-parenting. Give me 90 days to bring you some serious help to try to resolve this. And if it doesn't work, then you move on. Will you do that? Yes. You will do that? Yeah. And, and keep an open mind. And, uh, and it may not work, but at least at that time you'll be able to look your child in the eye and say, I was asked to take a serious look at this, and I gave it 100%. Will you, will you make that commitment to her? Yeah. Will you make that commitment to him? Absolutely. Are you okay with this plan? Yeah, absolutely. And you're okay with it? I know when to shut up. <laughs> All right, next, six tips for maintaining a successful relationship. We'll be right back. I want to give you six tips for maintaining a successful relationship, and you'll find these on drphil.com. Number one, you have to have a solid friendship. Now, think about what that means. What do friends do? They laugh together. They talk together. They tell each other what's going on in their lives, and that's so important. Number two, they meet each other's needs. And to do that, you have to know what your partner's needs are, and you need to make your needs known. Third, you need to set specific goals. What do you want in your relationship? That's so important. And four, get back to basics. You know, today, I ask you guys to think about why you got together to begin with. You know, where did you start? It's so important to get back to basics because you find each other for a reason. And then the noise kind of drowns all of that out. Get back to basics. Five, take responsibility. Come on, the only person you control is you. And if there are negatives in a relationship, turn them into a to-do list. Don't just cry about them, don't just whine about them. Put them on a to-do list so you can change them. All of those will be on drphil.com. I really thank both of you guys for coming here today. We have a plan for you guys and for you as well. And um, I, uh, I have great hope that you're going to give yourself permission to return to your current time frame and, and those children. Go home and love them up. Pick them up and laugh with them and giggle. It, uh, it, really, it, it really heals your heart. It really does. For more information on today's show, go to drphil.com. You can find me on Twitter and Facebook as well. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much. <laughs>